Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And tonight we're going to start out with Johnny Pesky. Johnny Pesky, born Johnny Paveskovich. He was 92 years old when he died recently, and he was the shortstop for the Boston Red Sox of the late 1940s and early 1950s. And there are certain teams in baseball that are iconic, even if they never won. Personally, I think of the 1969 Chicago Cubs. And Johnny Pesky's Boston Red Sox of that era, the late 40s and early 50s, was one of those teams. They were a very good team, but they never won. They lost in the 1946 World Series in seven games to the St. Louis Cardinals on a controversial play that involved Johnny Pesky, which we'll talk about. They lost in a playoff to the New York Yankees in 1949, which was chronicled in David Halberstam's book, Summer of 1949. And they were usually playing second fiddle either to the Yankees or to the Cleveland Indians, who were also good at that time. But Johnny Pesky was a mainstay of that team. He was the shortstop on that team. Good fielder, good hitter, not quite a Hall of Fame caliber player, but an extremely good player. Excellent bunter, collected over 200 hits three times, and was the consummate team player. In fact, Johnny Pesky's not known so much for his play as he is for being a personage in Boston. He was truly loved by everyone in and around the city. We talked recently about Joe Walsh, the Harvard baseball coach who died, and the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park. And Johnny Pesky was a mainstay around Fenway Park for almost 70 years. He's famous for two things. He's famous for the right field foul pole at Fenway Park, which is called Pesky Pole. That was a sort of a sarcastic jibe done by pitcher Mel Parnell because Johnny Pesky was not a home run hitter. And it was a sort of a, a jab at him for, well, this is where your home runs would go when you hit him. But he hit very few of them. Here's Johnny Pesky discussing the famous Pesky's pole. For years, it's been an unwritten rule that Fenway's right field pole be called Pesky's pole. Now it's official. On this, his 87th birthday, the team honored the former shortstop who somehow became known for curving shots around the pole. I only hit 17 home runs in 14 years. <laughs> To celebrate, Pesky was reunited with double play partner Bobby Doerr. This guy had to work hard for what he got. I'll tell you, everything, he worked hard and he's done remarkably well. Oh, boy, here. Bobby, maybe get a contract for next year, too. Yeah. The other thing Pesky's known for is a famous play in the 1946 World Series where he was the GOAT, although he didn't really deserve it. The score was tied in Game 7 between the Red Sox and the Cardinals, 3-3, three to three, and Enos Slaughter was on first base for the Cardinals. There was a ball hit into center field, and Enos Slaughter had taken off with the pitch. The regular center fielder for the Red Sox, Dom DiMaggio, wasn't in, and the center fielder they had and had a weaker arm. So when he rounded the ball into Johnny Pesky, Enos Slaughter kept going and headed towards home with the potential winning run. Johnny Pesky had to stop for a second, get a good hold on the ball, and was taken aback briefly because he didn't realize that Slaughter was heading home. By the time he made his throw to home plate, Slaughter had scored the winning run, and Pesky was forever known as holding the ball, when in reality it was a combination of events that he could not control. In addition to his pole, Johnny is also known for allegedly holding onto a ball too long during the 1946 World Series. While 60 years later, his teammates still defense him. Johnny, yeah. you remember how that outfield was? It was just big lumps of grass. It wasn't like a grass like this at all. And I'm sure when Colby went out there to play, played a little more conservative because he had a good chance of getting bad hops out there. I think he probably a little cautious of getting the ball in, maybe. And uh, this guy should have never got, got the blame like he did on that play. No matter what happened, Johnny will always be remembered fondly at Fenway, and he has the pole to prove it. And finally, Johnny Pesky is known for his long-standing friendship with his teammates, Ted Williams, Dom DiMaggio, and Bobby Doerr. They were all different personalities, and of course, Ted Williams is one of the all-time great to play baseball. And Dom DiMaggio is the brother of another all-time great to play baseball. But they were friends while they were with the Red Sox, and they remained friends from the late 1940s all the way until the deaths of Williams and DiMaggio. Nearly three-quarters of a century of friendship between these men. Here's an interview with Johnny Pesky late in his life on Boston Television about his friendship with these other Red Sox. It's just you, there's as good a player that's ever played this game. Uh, you know, you got to put in the class. Better than Ted? Uh, t well, I wouldn't say he was better than Ted, but he did a lot of things better than Ted. He ran better, uh, and he threw better, but Ted could hit a ball a ton. He oh, did. yeah. He hit a ball over 500 feet. He was a shy man, wasn't he? Oh. Ted? 
shy. <laughs> he was very outgoing. <laughs> really? Oh, sure. He'd have liked you. He'd have been all of you like a cold sweat. <laughs> no, he was, he was he was quite amazing. He was very bright. He and, and Bobby Doran, and Don, and, 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 and me, I came. I was the last of, the, of, of those guys. And, uh, and I, I might say this, I'm the youngest of them. And I'm not too far re removed from them in age. And But we all hit it off when we came to Boston. And then... Of course, when we went into the service, then we came back, we even got closer. Dominic DiMaggio is one of those people that's, that's a fine man. He has a great talent for friendship and a very wonderful man. He has done very, very well in business. He was a fine player. He's got that golden name, DiMaggio, and he loves Bobby Dorr and Ted. And, of course, I was the last of the group, and I horned in there pretty good. And uh, yeah. He called, he's, he's the guy, he calls us all, and we lost Ted a couple of years ago, and uh, Dom and I drove down to see him, and he was pretty sick, and, yeah. and then he died the next year. Yeah, it was just so sad. That was Johnny Pesky, more than just about baseball. We're going to move on now to our feature tonight, Sir Bernard Lovell, who died at the age of 98 recently. And Sir Bernard was the force behind the Jodrell Bank Telescope. This was a huge radio frequency telescope that was located outside of Manchester, that played a significant role not only in astronomy but in the geopolitics of the world in the 1950s and 60s. Sir Bernard started out during World War II working on radar systems that were instrumental in stopping the U-boat campaign of Hitler against the British. Through their early work with radar, they were able to blind bomb the German submarines that were attacking British ships. After the war, he moved on to developing a giant telescope owing to his interest in the new phenomenon of space and space travel. Here's Matthew Bannister of the BBC for a last word on Sir Bernard's early years. Dr. Tim O'Brien is the Associate Director of the Jodrell Bank Observatory. He was interested in uh, things called cosmic rays, which are particles that crash into the Earth's atmosphere from outer space, traveling at almost the speed of light. It turned out that uh, in order to do the observations he wanted to do, he needed to be away from the, the electrical noise of the city. And so he came out to this site at Jodrell Bank, about 20 miles south of Manchester, began making these radar observations and realised he needed larger equipment, bigger aerials, started to basically put these things together in the field at Jodrell Bank. It turned out that the cost estimates they had were much less than, in fact, the final cost of the project. Wildly out, you might say. Well, wildly were. No, I guess we're used to that these days. So am, I right, am I right in thinking they, they originally thought it was going to cost 60000 and it cost about 670000 It was something along those lines, yeah. So here's Sir Bernard in the early 50s. He's got this idea for this great radio frequency telescope. He can't build it in Manchester because of the electrical noise from the uh, trains and everything there. So he takes it 20 miles outside the city. It's still on the M6 today. It's this huge thing right outside the city on the M6 in the middle of nowhere. But it was costing more money than they could afford in an austere post-war Britain, and he got in a lot of trouble. And it looked for a time like he might go to jail. Here's his son talking about what was going on at the time when he was in trouble with the government. But the building of the telescope was fraught with difficulty. It was a substantial engineering challenge, and at one point the scheme ran out of money. Questions were asked in Parliament, and, as his son Brian recalls, Sir Bernard came under great personal pressure. I remember very clearly the Sunday afternoon on 10th of February, which is my 16th birthday, when Mother came to us and said, we want all five of you to come to Father's study, and he wants to tell you something. We knew, obviously, there was trouble brewing with the funding of the telescope, and we went in there, and Mother stood over Father by his desk, and she said, before Father tells you anything, I want you to know he has done nothing wrong. And then Father told us about the funding crisis with the telescope, and that if it couldn't be resolved, he might very well go to prison. Well, as I recall, my sisters were reasonably enough in tears, and I was absolutely livid. I was furious with the people who'd let things get to the position where, on the one hand, the government was praising... Uh, Jodrell Bank to the skies, and on the other hand, another part of the system of authority was chasing my father for what seemed to us a measly few hundred thousand quid. Well, Sir Bernard needed a miracle, and he got one. It was a real danger, it would never be finished, and then, you know, he was saying it needed a miracle for it to be saved, and in fact that miracle came with the launch of, of Sputnik 1. 
Dr. Heather Cooper writes and broadcasts about astronomy. This was the only instrument in the world that could actually track the rocket that had launched it. And the Americans were very suspicious as to the nature of this particular rocket. And about five days after the launch, Bernard tracked it and he found out it was actually an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, I think the important thing then was the, the, the press and the news media, which had been very alarmed and, uh, and on the whole were, were very much against me, suddenly, in a flash, turned right round and became a great supporter and on my side. That was not the end of our troubles, but it was the beginning of the end. I mean, a solution to the problems had to be found then. Well, ironically, that was the beginning of the end of the financial problems, and that saved Sir Bernard from jail but he developed new problems, and they were geopolitical ones. You don't hear it much today, but Sputnik was a major geopolitical issue between the Americans and the Soviets because of its military potential. And Sir Bernard attracted the attention of the Russians since he was able to track an ICBM, which not only could launch Sputnik, but could launch missiles. They invited him to Russia, and in this interview, according to him, they not only tried to recruit him, but when he wouldn't be recruited, they tried to kill him. But why was it so important to track not the Sputnik itself leaping as it went round, but the ballistic missile. The, the, the ballistic missile it was expected to be, and, and indeed did become, a vital instrument of international warfare. And I said, that, but I'm afraid we can tell you when they launch, there's no problem. Because we had most, one of the most powerful transmitters, well, certainly the most powerful transmitter in the world at that time. I said, well, then you can do nothing about it, neither can we. And he said, on the contrary, you would give us seven minutes warning before the missile descend on London, during which time we would have, we would have launched the whole of our bomber force. So the Jodrell Bank telescope was, in fact, this country's early warning system against nuclear attack. It's the Western world's early warning system. Well, they were very dark times, and indeed went on to be dark times for you individually, because on a trip to Russia, as I understand it, they tried to make you defect. I think I... I should have been prevented from, from going to the Soviet Union because they obviously knew that we had uh, been defense center. They tried to remove from my memory the fact that they'd taken me to their own defense nucleus uh, on the Black Sea coast because they, they didn't want to use what they had brought back to this country. I, I, I must say I'm, I was jolly thankful to see the lights, the lights of London on, on one return. Anyhow, I, I was ill for a very long time, but I recovered. But when you say you became ill coming back from that trip to Russia, yeah, yeah. And, you, and you think this was because something the Russians did? Yeah, it took me a month or so. I, I completely recovered. So. What did they do to actually make you feel ill? I, I think they had an extremely powerful transmitter of the type that we've had on the telescope uh, for planetary research. The, the, the radiation from this telescope here uh, was uh, so dangerous that we, we would never use it below an elevation of about 15 degrees for endangering uh, people's, people's brains. This is fairly sinister stuff, though, that you were there yeah, and then uh, they, they uh, made you fellow, up. It was a sinister time. And a lot, a lot of my compatriots who went to the Soviet Union in those days of the early 1960s and so on, they never did return. But when they did return, they never survived. And you know, I was very really the one of the fortunate one. It remains a, a, an interesting memory. I, I have written a detailed memorandum of the whole of that visit and of my previous and subsequent visits to the Soviet, uh, which uh, is in, now in the John Rylands archive and I've asked not to be published while I'm still living. Scary stuff that you don't hear about much today. But here ultimately is the astronomic legacy of the Jodrell Bank Telescope of Sir Bernard Lovell. Jodrell really has majored massively on, on pulsars, on these uh, rotating neutron stars. And they've been looking at the most distant parts of the universe, the most energetic objects like quasars, which are exploding galaxies, looking for evidence for black holes and looking for signals from extraterrestrial life. Is there any evidence that Jodrell Bank has found any of those? No. The Telegraph did a nice piece on Bernard Lovell that embodies what he was about at a time in post-war Britain. The story of Jodrell Bank could serve as a metaphor for post-war British scientific and industrial development. 
built in an atmosphere of argument and recrimination over its cost and plagued by constant union disputes and sniping crest's comment, it nevertheless triumphed against all the odds, contributing greatly to Britain's scientific reputation and to our understanding of deep space. When Lovell first proposed building the telescope in 1948, he estimated that it would cost around 60,000 pounds to build. After work began in 1950, it was soon clear that these figures were wildly optimistic, and in 1952 a more realistic sum of 333,000 pounds was agreed on, to be shared equally between the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research and the Nuffeld Foundation. But this, too, soon turned out to be an underestimate. The telescope ultimately cost 670,000 pounds, as the building work was plagued by strikes, bureaucratic delays, delivery failures, and escalating raw material costs. The project became the subject of heated debates in Parliament, and at one point, burdened by a debt of around a third of a million pounds and in trouble with the Public Accounts Committee, Lovell faced possible imprisonment for the alleged overspending of public money. The telescope came into operation still mired in controversy on August 2, 1957. Two months later, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1, the first ever artificial satellite, and Lovell's 250-foot diameter device proved its worth as the only telescope in the Western Hemisphere capable of tracking it. The detection of Sputnik silenced the critics who had condemned the telescope as a costly and an unnecessary white elephant. It produced not only the first trackings of Sputnik, but also its carrier rocket, the first ever intercontinental ballistic missile. From then on, and for much of the Cold War, Jodrell Bank covered parts of the sky that the Soviet and often American astronomers could not reach. When the American astronauts landed on the moon in 1969, it was Lovell who revealed that, despite promising that they would put nothing into orbit that would interfere with Apollo 11, the Russians had attempted to steal a march on the Americans by landing their own unmanned space probe, which had crashed on the moon shortly before the Americans arrived. But Lovell never envisioned his telescope being used as the part of the Western Army in the Cold War, and it was Jodrell Bank's contribution to astronomy that kept it in the forefront of science. As director of Jodrell Bank Experimental Station from 1951 to 1981, Lovell presided over a string of new and important discoveries, which have shed light on the origins of the universe. In 1960, the telescope caught the first glimpses of quasars, mysterious star-like objects which radiate with the violence of a hundred million suns. Almost two-thirds of all known pulsars have been discovered by Jodrell Bank astronomers from signals received from deep space and radio echoes from the moon enable Jodrell Bank scientists to give a new accuracy to measurements of the solar system. In 1960, Lovell pulled off a notable coup when the telescope was employed to transmit signals to the American Pioneer 5 deep space probe to release it from its carrier rocket the only device capable of doing so at a distance of more than 22 million miles. Afterward, Lovell took a telephone call from Nor Lord Neufeld. Is that Lovell? Yes, my lord. How much is still owing on that telescope? About 50,000 pounds, my lord. Is that all? I want to pay it off. And thus was the story of the Jodrell Bank Telescope of Sir Bernard Lovell. Here he talks about its legacy. This telescope of Jodrell Bank, although it's working marvelously at the moment, obviously has a limited life. I thought 20 years ago that, for example, we knew all that we wanted to know about the structure and evolution uh -huh. of the universe, and now we know almost nothing. And Matthew Bannister talking to his son one last time. Are you very proud of him, Brian? Yes, who wouldn't be? Well, I'm going to close on that note, and I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And as a final tribute to Sir Bernard Lovell, I want to play a song that was popular in the mid-60s, when the Lovell Telescope was doing so much of its work. It's a British song. It was written and first performed by a man named Jonathan King right around the time that the Apollo mission was in full swing in the United States. It was a couple years before the United States astronauts went to the moon, but they had spent four days in space in preparation for ultimately going to the moon at the end of the decade. It's a haunting little piece that captivated the entire world. It's been covered many, many times. And tonight we're going to use the version not by Jonathan King, who originally wrote and recorded it, but by an underrated British invasion duo, Chad and Jeremy. So in tribute to Sir Bernard Lovell, here is Everyone's Gone to the Moon. Everyone's gone to the moon. Everyone's gone to the moon.
one time.